Welcome to Storm Watch 2023. I'm Mary Blakeney coming to you from the Governor's Hurricane Conference at the Palm Beach County Convention Center. For more information on preparedness, go to readypbc.com. Now let's take a look at some of the interviews we conducted during the conference. We're now joined by Eric Roby, Executive Director of the American Red Cross Palm Beach and Treasure Coast Chapter. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for having me. So we're excited to have you here at the Governor's Hurricane Conference where we're really focusing on the upcoming hurricane season and what could what could impact the county this year. So tell us a little bit about what, what the Red Cross is doing to prepare for hurricane season. Well, you know, the Red Cross not only helps people after a disaster, but we do our best to try and make sure that as many people as possible are prepared for a disaster. Not only hurricane season, but any type of disaster like uh, the recent tornado that we saw that hit uh, um, Palm Beach County. So we just wanna remind people that even though that we have not seen a direct hit from a hurricane in a while, that this could be our year and it is always better to be prepared and uh, then think that we're lucky rather than not be prepared. So what is it that your, your volunteers might be doing to prepare to respond? And let's talk about what that response would look like. Well, you know, what I would consider our first line of response is our preparedness programs, where we help to make sure not only adults, but also children understand the importance of preparing for storm season and exactly what they should be doing. Obviously at age appropriate messaging, uh, but for the parents, we really have that discussion of, do you have an evacuation plan? Are you in evacuation zone? Know that information immediately. What does it look like for your kit? What supplies should you have on hand and how much? And once you start really drilling down to some of the specifics, a lot of people were surprised of the amount that uh, is recommended for people to have. And uh, now the recommendation is not only three days worth of supplies, but it really should be five days to up to two weeks. So let's talk about that when a storm approaches. So what activities is the Red Cross doing to prepare for the storm as an organization? So we prepare for a storm 365 days out of the year. We do trainings throughout the year. We do simulations throughout the year to make sure when we are needed, we are ready to go. So for the Red Cross, this is our full-time job and we make sure that anyone who is going to be a responder for the Red Cross knows what to do, knows how to be safe, and knows how to most efficiently help those that are in need. So this is something that we're very used to doing. It's something that we do well. But another piece of that puzzle and something that we're really doubling down on uh, as we're seeing an increase of storms throughout the country is making sure that we have strong partnerships. As we are starting to see more storms, more intense storms, the Red Cross realizes that this job is too big for one organization, even an organization as large as the Red Cross. So we are making sure that we have those community partners that might be hyper local small nonprofits, but they're just as important to us because they can reach a, a segment of the population faster and better than anyone else potentially. So let's talk about what you all do in the recovery phase of a disaster. How can Red Cross come in and help the community? Well, unfortunately, we have an excellent case study, uh, just a, a two and a half hour drive from here, from West Palm Beach uh, over to, to Lee County where Hurricane Ian uh, just devastated that community. The Red Cross has guaranteed that we are gonna be in that community for at least two years because that is how long it's going to take for long-term recovery to, to happen. You know, immediately when the Red Cross comes in, we bring in volunteers from around the country and, and quite frankly, around the world, if it is a big enough event like we saw with Hurricane Ian, to make sure that we are handing out those hot meals, that water, uh, sheltering people, all of those essentials that are needed just to sustain life after a disaster. But then after that, we quickly transition to help people directly that have either suffered a direct, uh, complete loss of a home or uh, major damage. And that might be uh, direct cash assistance. Um, it could be mental health counseling. It could be helping to supply needed medications. And that's only step one. Step two is we start looking at if there's gonna be any other needs that each individual family might need to make sure that they recover. 
It is a significant number where people who are already on the edge of just being able to pay the bills, that they potentially could be made homeless because of a storm. So the Red Cross works really hard to see what those barriers are, and then we try to solve those barriers, not only from within the Red Cross, but also working with our partners. And then we've taken it a step further this time around with Hurricane Ian, where we're actually working with some of those other nonprofits, and we're handing out grants so that they can make sure that they continue that long-term recovery and we follow up, follow up, follow up. I just spoke to a gentleman today. He was diagnosed with cancer right before Hurricane Ian, lived on Fort Myers Beach, lost everything. He was homeless for multiple months after the storm, but because of a caseworker, um, a volunteer working for the Red Cross stayed on top of that case, made sure that he was able to get into a, uh, a trailer uh, that was provided by the federal government so that he could recover instead of recover uh, inside of a tent, which is what he was doing. So each family, each person is different and the Red Cross really tries to walk them through that path to get them to where they need to go so that they can have a, a full recovery. So it, it's a large puzzle, it's complex, and it's different for every person. So let's close it out by sharing with our viewers how maybe they could get involved in Red Cross if they'd like to do that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I like to say, if you have time, you have the energy and you have the desire, we have a job for you at the Red Cross. Uh, it, you don't necessarily have to deploy across the country. Um, when someone does deploy for the Red Cross, it's usually for two weeks. Some people love to help out that way. Myself, I have kids, I have pets, I can't do that. But there are plenty of jobs here locally with the Red Cross uh, because we handle so many different programs even outside of storm season. And all you need to do is call 1-800-RED-CROSS or go to redcross.org and sign up and we'll do an interview with you to find out what your skills are, what your desires are, and then we'll hopefully set you on a path to be a successful volunteer. Great information, Eric, and we always encourage our viewers to get involved. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And we'll be right back with more Stormwatch. I'm Jamie Rome, Deputy Director with the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. One of the most effective things you can do to prepare you and your family for this hurricane season is to ensure that you're getting your information from reliable sources. Not just anyone on the internet, reliable government sources such as hurricanes.gov for the National Hurricane Center or local information from emergency management officials. So this hurricane season, make sure you're getting trusted, reliable information. Welcome back to Stormwatch. I'm Mary Blakeney. I'm now joined by Dr. Phil Klotzbach, Senior Research Scientist at Colorado State University. Welcome, Phil. Thanks so much, Mary. It's good to we're see you again. So, we're so <laughs> glad to have you here. You know what? Let's just start with our viewers. Why is a Senior Research Scientist from Colorado State University, what are you doing with hurricanes? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, people always ask, you know, why are why do people in Colorado forecasting hurricanes? And so Dr. Bill Gray was my mentor. He used to always say it's because a storm surge can't get you at 5,000 feet. Uh, but in all seriousness, so the guy that started our department, his name was Herbert Real. He came from the University of Chicago, which is still nowhere near hurricanes. But he was a really big guy in the hurricane field at the time. And so Dr. Gray was actually finishing off his PhD. Um, and so he came out and joined Herbert just a couple of years later. Um, so while well, our apartment does a ton of different stuff. Um, we've always had at least one professor, often multiple professors, working specifically on hurricane research. So let's talk about that. Like, so what, is, what does that mean? Like, when, when you say you're doing hurricane research, is it current storms, past storms? What are you focusing on? Basically everything. I mean, but my interest is what's, basically what makes hurricanes tick on, you know, for the next hour to, the, to climate change timescales, like from, hour from now to 100 years from now. Being able to do research means I can research all those timescales. Primary focus of what we do though is basically seasonal to sub-seasonal. So not necessarily forecasting like tomorrow. Um, well, I obviously find that extremely interesting, uh, but we do more like what's gonna happen in say the next two to three weeks. So where are storms likely to form then? More out to the seasonal timescale. So how, how busy do we expect the upcoming hurricane season to be? 
So let's talk about that and let's talk about what you've seen. How, how long, first of all, how long have you been at Colorado State University? So I, start, I came out to go to grad school in 2000 and they haven't been able to get rid of me yet. <laughs> so, so that's 23 years mm -hmm. of really focusing on hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So what have you seen the evolution of hurricanes to be, even in that time frame you've been studying hurricanes? Yeah, well, especially when it comes to like seasonal forecasting, we just have so much better data than we did even say 20, 25 years ago. And a lot of it, it might sound funny, is that we actually know better what happened in the past now than we used to. Um, the Because basically our forecasts are built a lot on, okay, historically, what has kind of led to busy seasons? So where when water temperatures are warm in this region, that lends to, to a busier season. If they're warm in this other region, that lends to a quieter season. So we look at a lot of these historical relationships. Um, and so we have more and more historical data or basically just better reliable historical data. So we can go back and look at say 40 to 50 years of past data that gives us good information. We also now have climate models and not talking climate model like predicting 100 years from now, looking at the next few months. And so these models aren't perfect, but they can tell you not necessarily, you know, what's the weather gonna be, you know, 38 days from now, but they can give you a good forecast on a monthly time scale. So when, for example, um, you know, on June 1st, we're looking, okay, what do the models say are forecasting for August to September? Um, because even though those forecasts aren't perfect, they do give us some skill. And obviously if we can know kind of what the water temperatures, the wind patterns are gonna look like during the peak of the season, um, that gives us useful information in terms, because basically if the, if the winds are weaker, so basically if you have less wind shear, which tears apart hurricanes, if you have less of that shear and warmer water, that tends to lead to a busier season. So if we can get a decent forecast of that, we can know better whether or not the season's gonna have above normal, normal or below normal activity. So when you're, when you're making those predictions, let's just say you're a chef in a kitchen and you're baking a cake. What are the ingredients that you're looking for to determine if we're gonna be an above average or below average season? Mm -hmm. And so one of the big things that we've looked at, and this goes back all the way to Dr. Bill Gray in the early 1980s is, are we going to have El Nino conditions? El Nino is warmer than normal water in the Eastern and Central Tropical Pacific Ocean. When we get El Nino, that tends to basically increase the strength of winds high up in the atmosphere, say 25 to 30,000 feet out of the west. And if you have stronger winds at upper levels, that tends to tear apart hurricanes as they're trying to develop into intensify. So you tend to get overall weaker hurricane seasons when you have El Nino conditions. Um, another big factor that we monitor every year is what does the Atlantic look like? Um, are the waters there warmer or colder than normal? Um, and what um, basically what are the pressure patterns like? What's the moisture like? All these different factors go into our seasonal outlooks. And so while general public often just hears numbers, if you're interested, we have a 30 to 40 page PDF that comes out with all of our seasonal forecasts. So if you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can download that and look and see kind of basically all the different stuff that we're looking at. And we actually have PDFs of every single forecast going back all the way to 1984. So there's thousands upon thousands of archives of forecasts, which sounds like, you know why, but it's actually really important to go back and look and see, for example, at the end of the year when we verify our forecast to see, okay, how good or bad did we do? And then try to figure out, okay, if the forecast didn't pan out the way we thought, what were we looking at? What did we miss? And then how can we better kind of adapt our models to whatever happened that in that season? Knowing that you've looked in all those archives and studied past storms, is there a storm or a season right now that comes to your mind that says that was a big one? Yeah, I mean, so when we're looking historically, obviously the, the, the Palm Beach area in 1928, the Lake Okeechobee hurricane is kind of like basically close to the worst case scenario for this region. So obviously that's thankfully been a very, very long time, but obviously that's kind of probably the worst case scenario for this particular county. Um, obviously 1926 was a devastating hurricane a little farther south that went down, pretty much made landfall in downtown Miami. That is basically the historical storm they estimate if it were to come along again today would cause the most overall damage. Uh, they estimate, light estimates range 250, maybe $300 billion. For comparison though, Ian was over $100 billion. So, you know, we have seen some really high, high dollar amount hurricanes. A lot of that just because more and more people are moving to the coast. And obviously if there's a lot of property along the coast and you get a hurricane hitting, it's just gonna cause a lot of damage and cause devastation to that property. What do you wanna share as a last thought for our viewers before we wrap up today? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with all the seasonal forecasts, you know, the seasonal forecasts aren't perfect. The April forecast has modest skill. June has good skill. July and August have better skill. 
But, you know, while in general, more active seasons have more landfalling and hurricanes, you can still have very significant impactful hurricanes in even below normal seasons. And for example, last year was, you know, a near normal hurricane season, but obviously the two major hurricanes that formed last year, Fiona was obviously devastating in Puerto Rico um, and then caused a lot of damage up in the up in the Atlantic provinces of Canada. And obviously Ian was, you know, a tremendously devastating storm in southwest Florida. Um, so that's kind of what we try to emphasize that, you know, Regardless of the seasonal forecast, it's important to be prepared every hurricane season because it just takes out one storm near you to make it a busy season. Great point to end on. Thank you so much, Phil, for joining us again. Thank you. Now let's hear what was learned during the Governor's Hurricane Conference. We were there at this year's Governor's Hurricane Conference, where over 840 booths highlighted vendors, providing multiple solutions, approaches, training and technology in dealing with the potential challenges of hurricane season. We manufacture the Tiger Dam system, which is basically big tubes that are filled with water. They're put up at the onset of flooding. They divert floodwaters. Uh, they're used for containment. Uh, we're used all over the country. We're about 20 years old, so we've been using this product all over the United States and several other countries for many years. It's a buildable system, so it's stackable and links together. You can build literally any size barrier that you need for any disaster. Yeah, sandbags are is old technology. They're great for small uh, response, maybe doorways. They work for a short period of time. Tiger Dam can be used over vast distances, over miles, and can be literally stacked to any height. So it's different than a sandbag in that it creates an actual impermeable wall. This is probably the strongest reusable product in the marketplace. It can take a beating, it can take storm surge, it's highly resistant to debris impact. Um, it's made of a flexible proprietary PVC. When filled with water it conforms to the ground. Um, we anchor it when we're expecting dynamic energy like tidal surge, storm surge. It's literally the strongest system in the marketplace. We're FM approved with a platinum certification. This system has been used all over the state of Florida for Hurricane Ian and Nicole, as well as several other hurricanes that have happened the previous years. But the state of Florida has engaged Tiger Dams on many, many projects. One of the most recent ones was in Daytona Shores, where they used Tiger Dam, about 3,000 feet of Tiger Dam along the beach to protect from coastal erosion that was uh, scouring embankments and uh, houses were falling into the ocean. So yeah, we're used, we're used all over the place in Florida. So unfortunately, part of the deal of living in South Florida, we will eventually be impacted by a hurricane. We've been extremely lucky, so do not let that luck make you complacent. Realize that this is just a part of living here in South Florida. You have to do your due diligence. You can go to redcross.org. We have a bunch of lists of things that should be in your kit so that you're ready to go. And you really should have two kits. One kit for your home, which is gonna have more supplies, including a gallon of water per day, per person, per pet in your household, but also a go kit in case you have to evacuate quickly. Make sure that you have that kit that you throw in a backpack and you have a couple days worth of supplies in case you do have to go to a shelter. So if the worst happens and we are hit with a hurricane, please reach out to the Red Cross. We are here to help. We do our best to find the areas where we are needed, but if you're ever in need, call 1-800-RED-CROSS or go to redcross.org. There you can sign up and we will know that you need help or your neighbors need help. So I am the program director for our Masters of Emergency and Crisis Management program. We are ranked number two in the nation. We also have a full bachelor's of emergency management available at the undergraduate level. So the great thing is that our program is all hazards, whole community, and a culturally competent approach. So our students are leaving with not only the academic expertise, but they also are engaged with our practitioner um, uh, community, and so they are getting hands-on experience before they graduate. There is a website, if you search for UCF Emergency and Crisis Management Programs, the website will appear.
Severe weather can strike anytime, anywhere, but there's a simple way to stay safe. Hey, Jim Cantori here. I stay safe in dangerous weather by planning ahead. You can stay safe too with a few easy steps. Build an inexpensive kit with supplies for your family's needs. Write down important information like phone numbers and medications. Always talk with your family and remember any pets in your planning. Be ready, be safe, start your plan today at ready.gov slash plan. Welcome back to Stormwatch. I'm Mary Blakeney. I'm now joined by John Mills from the Federal Emergency Management Agency Region 7 Incident Management Team as the External Affairs Officer. Welcome, John. Mary, thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. We're glad to have you. So I would love to hear just a little bit, tell our viewers a little bit about your role with FEMA and the Incident Management Team. My IMAT team is a 13-member team and we have not only me as the external affairs officer, but operations, planning, logistics, and a team lead. We can deploy at the request of a state to help support state operations, and we can also set up a, a temporary branch office in an area that's been hard hit by a disaster. In terms of hurricane season, sometimes we will deploy in advance of the storm so we can be on the ground and working right after the storm as soon as it's safe to do so. So let's talk about that role. Um, if, for example, the state of Florida called you in pre-disaster, what type of work are you doing um, with your agency and coordinating with the state? Well, we can coordinate with FEMA headquarters and then we come in in support of a state like Florida. My team, for example, was first on the ground in New Orleans in 2021 after Hurricane Ida. We went to New Orleans and set up a temporary branch office to help provide information and also logistical support such as commodities or disaster recovery centers or other types of assistance that could be provided there at the local level in support of requests that we get from the state. And also uh, when local communities such as county emergency management would make a request to the state for a need, we would try to coordinate across the federal government if that need could not be met at the local or state level. And you bring up, it's, it's great to know that FEMA is well in, well, well in advance of a storm. So let's talk about what the, the phases of the, of the disaster, it, basically hurricanes. You, you all are on the ground in advance, but what is the progress? What type of things is FEMA doing before, during, and immediately after an event? And we're always in preparedness mode. So my team is either preparing, training, or responding, and then doing an after action and getting ready to respond again. Here in Florida, it's really important to remember this. Go back 2016 through 2022, just last year. In the last seven hurricane seasons, Florida has received eight major disaster declarations for hurricanes. Hurricanes don't hit every year. Unfortunately, sometimes you get more than one hurricane making landfall in a single year. That's just reality and we're all adapting to that. And that's why it's really important for families and households to be prepared, have a plan, have a family communications plan, and be ready to listen to local officials when they say evacuate or get ready to evacuate and really follow the guidance of local officials about what to do as that storm is approaching. And of course, also listen to state officials as well. So let's clear up a couple misconceptions maybe that are out there, or maybe you can clarify for our viewers a disaster happens, the impact, of, the community has been impacted, and residents might be saying, when is FEMA coming? So let's talk about the, when is FEMA coming to provide assistance? Can you walk us through that process of how that happens? Sure, I mean, you know, insurance is really your first line of defense. So we encourage everyone to maintain homeowner's insurance and anywhere in Florida, get flood insurance. In Florida, you either live in a high-risk flood zone or you live near one. So get flood insurance. Homeowners insurance does not cover flooding. Please get flood insurance. Uh, whether you have insurance or not, after a major disaster declaration is requested by the governor and approved by the president, FEMA can provide various forms of assistance as requested by the state and approved uh, by the federal government. That can include individual assistance for homeowners and renters who have serious damage at their primary residence. Homeowners and renters may apply. Uh, you may be able to get money for some 
basic home repairs, temporary rental assistance if you need to relocate because of the damage temporarily, uh, and also money for other needs, such as replacing personal property that was destroyed in the disaster. We'll work with each household one-on-one -on, -one on a case-by-case -case basis. FEMA's individual assistance program, though, is not a replacement for insurance. It's really designed by Congress just to help jumpstart recovery for survivors, to give people a hand up, to help people get back on their feet, help them prevent, help prevent them from becoming homeless as a direct result of the storm, but it's not designed to rebuild everything, and that can be a misconception. And then separate from that, we will also work with local governments to help them get reimbursements through the state for their disaster-related expenses, for debris removal, emergency protective measures, and the restoration of uh, public infrastructure and facilities. I think you, bring up, you brought up a couple really key points. FEMA is not an insurance policy, so that, that doesn't take place of an insurance policy. But let's talk about when does FEMA come? You know, we get a lot of um, heavy rainfall days or very minor wind or tornado events. Why wouldn't FEMA come in some of those? Let's talk about when they come in. By law, for uh, when the governor asks for a disaster declaration, generally speaking, the letter that the governor writes needs to say that the damage is so severe that recovering from it is beyond the capabilities of the state and the local communities affected, including insurance and all of the charitable organizations in the area. And so that can be a very high bar because fortunately, this area has a lot of resources in the community to help people who are affected. Just think of the Red Cross and Salvation Army, just to name two great organizations and all the wonderful charitable, nonprofit and faith-based organizations. So you don't need a major disaster declaration to file and submit an insurance claim, including for flooding. A major disaster declaration requires that that higher level of damage that's beyond state capabilities requiring federal assistance. So just to wrap it up here with us today, what is one message that as a, a FEMA representative you'd like to share with our residents? I would visit ready.gov and you can make a family plan, make a communications plan. How will you know everyone in your family is okay? If you do have to evacuate, do you have a place to go that's out of harm's way? And if, if you can't think of a place to go right away, make that part of your plan now. Make all of these actions in advance. And if you go to ready.gov, you can get a lot of great information about how to customize a plan to meet your family's needs. Great information for our residents. We really appreciate you taking the time talking to us today, John. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you for watching Stormwatch from the Governor's Hurricane Conference at the Palm Beach County Convention Center. I'm Mary Blakeney. Stay safe.